go. Okay, come in. So explain to me what a yurt is. <laughs> <laughs> a yurt, well, I didn't know what a yurt was until a couple of years ago, but a yurt is a semi-permanent tent structure. And uh, most yurts are built structurally from wood. Mine is actually built from steel and um, it's a circular structure. So you can see here. Yeah. It goes all the way around. Oh, wow. Right. And then the ceiling. Oh, yeah, see, yeah, yeah. Goes up like that. And it's uh, actually on a deck in my backyard and it's about 300 square feet. 300 square feet. Wow. Shit, that's big. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very cool. When I do circles um, and have women in here, I can comfortably fit 10 and everybody lays in a circle. Um, I like everybody with their head on the outside. Uh, or I can probably fit like 16 in here all laying down. Yep. Yeah. So that's what a year it is. That's awesome. That's, that's a good description. I think... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think it's so cool to have like a, a space specifically for breath work because it's almost like the the vibe. Um, yeah. It's just almost there to begin with, you know. Absolutely, and um, specifically circular is what I've learned that it, it appears as though there's a difference between you know rectangular or square versus circular. It's like the energy does this thing where it just goes kind of around and round like a tornado, right? Mm. And then up, 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 because a lot of times there's a hole in the top too. So it just goes up and around. It's, it's insane. Yeah. That's awesome. So were you, cause you did the course with Siobhan and I'm looking forward to yeah. hearing about your story and, and what drew you to breath work, but did you have the yurt um, before you did the course or what was it being used for before that? Yeah. Well, I actually, um, I started doing breath work, prob- facilitating breath work, almost a year before I took the course. Oh, nice. <laughs> and it was, um, not really on purpose. I never wanted to facilitate breath work. Um, but I, people kept coming to, I did it with one or two people, uh, kind of by accident actually. And then people kept coming to me and coming to me and coming to me. And then the community kept coming to me and then I'm like, Oh, I better get maybe some official training. <laughs> and, um, so that's what I did. So the yurt was about halfway up by the time it was a long process. It was, it took a really long time to get it up about six months or so. Mm. And, uh, it was about halfway up when I went out to New Mexico and did that course. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, for me, breath work, I'd never even heard of it really before. Like I'd heard about people doing weird things with their lungs, you know, and their mouths and things, yeah. Um, yeah. but never for a, a healing modality or whatever. So when did it first come into your scope? Like when did you start to go, holy shit, this is, this is deeper than what I thought it was? Well, um, okay. So to date, I've actually never, ever done uh, like yoga or anything like that right? Which is uncommon in my area because I'm in Southern California mm. and everybody's doing that all the time. Um, a couple years ago, two and a half years ago or so, it was actually the first week of March of 2018. I uh, left my ex-husband and uh, my ass is, can I cuss? Yeah, okay, please. Okay. Fucking okay. go okay. for it. <laughs> <laughs> My ass was falling off and I was losing my shit and I didn't know what the fuck was going on. And I did not know how to manage the feelings that were coming into my body. Cause I, we were together for eight years, mm. nothing major that happened. I just had a huge realization that I could no longer be with this man, you know? Um, and he wasn't a bad guy and we never fought. It was any of that, but I was just like dead inside, you yep. know, yep. I can get into that later, but the first time I tried it, it was actually my business t- partner because my day job is uh, I'm a mortgage broker. Okay. Right. And, um, <laughs> Yin and yang. <laughs> so, so, oh yeah, it's a uh, corporate, you know, all that. I've always been like, That's awesome. you know, done kind of thing. Right. And my business partner is like, Hey, you got to try this thing. I think you're going to love it. And I'm like, okay, fucking whatever. Like you're full of shit. You know, she's always doing these different healing things. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and, um, she said, I'll just pay for your first session. And there just happened to be somebody that lives in the same city that I do. 
in the suburbs of San Diego. And, uh, and I went over there and I got there and I'm like, oh man, this bitch, there's no way. Yeah. Right. In this white flowy clothes, she's got like grayish blonde hair and she's got this giant yurt. And I'm like, I don't know what the fuck this is. I'm just going to show up and whatever. And as soon as I sat down and I talked with her, I realized that she wasn't just uh, what I imagined in my head as the white flowy clothes people, you know, she was amazing. And, uh, she talked like a sailor. She talked like me and she understood me and she sat me down and she's like, okay, we're going to try this thing. And it was as if the bricks that were at the very tops of all my emotional walls just started to crumble mm. and and go lower and lower and just like pull one by one. And, and I kept coming back. I can't, and it wasn't, you know, it, it was deep. Right. And I kept coming back every week and it was like every week she handed me a chisel energetically. Right. And just like knocked some stuff down. And I am a different person today than I ever was uh, in March of 2018. Yeah. Wow. I th- you know, I think <clears throat> one of the points that you just made, which I really love is when we think about, um, you know, healing, th- th- all these words have so much baggage and I'm exactly the same with you. When I think of people that facilitate this kind of shit, I just think of like, Hey, we're all one flowy people that, you know, and you know, best of luck to them. But they have a specific group of people that resonate with them. And then there are other people like yourself that happen to be a mortgage broker and happen to be in all these other things where it's just like that kind of jargon and that kind of individual may or just may not probably resonate with you. And I think like what this world is coming to now is to see that like there's a beautiful balance between wanting to work on yourself and do all the work, but calling yourself a witch and being a mortgage broker and wanting to do all these other things as well that just happen to be other very authentic expressions of who you are. And I think that's what makes you so cool and real is because you express the full spectrum, you know, not just one side that happens to be in whatever that is. Yeah. And and I just, I couldn't take anyone, uh, and, and this is my judgmental aspects, right? My own fears, not wanting to like get close to people or fucking whatever. I have never been a super people person, right? Um, that's not true. I am kind of, but I let people know when I don't really like them. Right. It's not always a good thing to do, but you know, the fact of the matter is, is that I would see people, um, running around and just like love and light and do this and, Oh yes. And it's all about, you know, uh, and I would just be like, do you have any idea what I've fucking been through? Like bills, you know, (laughs) whatever it is, right. It's had this circular and this linear. And it's funny because uh, I immediately was attracted to Siobhan. I'm like, okay, she's cool. Like I, I like her. She's not exactly like the others, you know? And then of course my judgmental, I'm also a Virgo rising. So I'm highly judgmental. And, um, you know, uh, I kind of stuck out like a sore thumb, uh, at that training that I did in New Mexico with her. Mm. I most certainly didn't look like anybody else that was there. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, uh, yeah. And you know, maybe, maybe for whatever reason it's us, that's actually like, you know, to your point, like the judgment is with us. Cause it's like, okay, there's a lot of stuff that's keeping us separated from, they seem so, why are they always talking about love and why are they having so much fun? Life shouldn't be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get it done, you exactly. know? Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, but, but on, on that side of things, you know, you hear a lot about like love and light. Right. And, um, I'm not love and light. I I'm dark and down. Everything that I do when I work with people is in the descend, right? I go down, down, down. I don't go up and out. It's everything is down. And there's just a little bit of a difference there. And I noticed there are a lot of people that are like, you know, fill your body with light and this and that. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's just not my style, you know? Yeah. Okay. So fill your body with red, black smoke. That's not what I'm saying, but it's, a little bit different. Yeah. So if you could explain the difference for us there, because obviously both sides are the same coin, but what is the darkness and what is the going into the descent sort of thing? I think, you know, and and it's sometimes it's hard to explain just as breath work is difficult to explain to anyone that hasn't done it, you know? Um, But when I work with women, I ask them to reach into those cracks and crevices 
that are normally completely covered up. I ask them to look into their private self and their secret self. I ask them to look for, you know, the mother and the maiden and the whore, you know, um, the piece of them that they absolutely would never want anybody to see that we don't have to show this beautiful, perfect face of love and light. We can show this ugly, crazy, you know, needs to heal peace that needs to also get out that balance between masculine and feminine, you know, yeah. I, I struggle sometimes because sometimes I lean too much into the masculine, right? So I got to force myself into the love and light sometimes, you know? But at the, at the same time, um, masculine's actually white and, and feminine is actually black, right? And, and feminine is um, circular, right? And masculine and wavy and it doesn't make sense and not illogical and all that. And, and masculine is linear and like mortgage, banking, houses, jobs, nine to five, you know, and, um, but when I work with people, I ask them to go far, far, far deep into themselves, if they can access it and go toe to toe with that being that's inside of there, almost like the, shadow. go toe to toe and say, fight me, fuck me, whatever it is. Right. Mm-hmm. But we're not going to ignore it. That's what we're not going to do. You know? And, um, I work with women in, in, I tend to get a lot of women who are very, very, very tough and would never do anything like breath work, which are, mm-hmm. you know, like me. So what do you mean by tough? Uh, women that have been through a lot and, you know, the tough as nails, like holding everything down, like, you know, has, has gone through the ringer, has maybe been to jail, been to prison, um, you know, gotten sober. I'm in recovery myself. So I deal with a lot of people that are in recovery. Right. And just, just been through too much, like layers and layers and layers of abuse that caused these Mm -hmm. walls to go way up, you know, for protection purposes. And I'm able to hold space. And that term is so lame, right? Hold space. Um, I'm able to, um, hold the container, right? For people with that level of trauma, because I've been through it myself. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I think, um, again, that, that, that idea, which I think you, um, represent so well is that the full spectrum, you know, it's not just, the, the ocean isn't just calm, you know, it can also show tidal waves and it can be crazy and all that sort of stuff. And I, I think we do yeah. a lot of damage, um, to our own selves, you know, if, if we're just being this one person all the time, this is actually what I'm so pumped about in this day and age is that people are starting to see that the nine to five, you know, and to your point, like that person's necessary. Like we, we do need to pay bills and we, so we have responsibilities and all that sort of stuff. But if we become just that person, we're suppressing a really, really, really big part of us that will come up anyway. Hey. Absolutely. And, and for me, I have to do some of the nine to five, you know, I have a, a out here in California it, it is absolutely insane with uh, mortgage rates and the politics that are occurring and the rates are so low and people are buying houses. I also do real estate. I also do escrow. I also like, I've had multiple businesses, right? Mm. Very, very good at it. Um, but I will die inside if I don't birth creativity on a regular basis, yeah. right? Because I cannot make certain decisions in my life from that place. Like I can't make decisions about my children's school life. Right. Or, or financial decisions from my, from my, my witch personality, right. Or my love and light or whatever I'm being right of, of only creativity and it'll all work out and trust the universe. I have to take the piece of me that's linear, Mm -hmm. right. Those decisions. So there's all these different pieces of me that I can tap into and utilize to live on a regular basis and have a successful and happy life. And I've never been so happy 
I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it, it, it makes perfect sense. And the question that came up for me was, did you find it? Cause I think this will resonate with a lot of people. Um, did you find it difficult to, um, you know, to use a cliche, express who you are on the outside, the full spectrum feel like, was that like a, a gradual thing as you were doing your own kind of healing work or have you always just been very comfortable just to do that? Um, so by nature, right. Like I said, I'm sober. So I'm an alcoholic and an addict and all that good stuff. And, um, yeah. because of that, one of the things that is very, very common for alcoholics and addicts is, is people to not be comfortable in their own skin mm. and do the whole chameleon thing, just get in where you fit in and just kind of wear a mask. Right. So it has been excruciatingly painful for me to fall into my own. Mm. And not because, um, I don't know, there, there's a thousand reasons. I don't want to be seen, right? Because it's terrifying to be seen, okay? Because if I'm seen, then you can hurt me. If you know me, then you can hurt me. Because I've been hurt really, really badly before, mm-hmm. right? So if I'm seen, if I'm seen exactly who I am, like maybe you won't accept me. Maybe you won't like me. I want everybody to like me. Blah, 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 blah. It just on and on and on and on. But the fact of the matter is, is that the actual antidote to the fear of being seen is being seen, right? <laughs> Leaning into that vulnerability. But in order to lean into that vulnerability, I have to work through, you know, the layers and layers of shame from this trauma based life that I've lived for many years previous. Right. So, um, it is not easy. I didn't even start really dressing and doing my makeup and, and looking like I wanted to look until I left my ex-husband mm. and not he ever said that I couldn't, but I just was so not being honest with myself in so many areas of my life. I wasn't living my truth because I was in a relationship that didn't have passion and love. Mm. That's a whole nother fucking podcast, but still like, you know, (laughs) but it's, it's terrifying to being seen. And I am not an exception to the rule. I don't just like stand out there and be like, Oh, I'm being seen. You know, I post things on Instagram that are highly uncomfortable for me, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to empower women or anybody really to be able to be seen that it's not as scary once you actually rip the bandaid off. And there's going to be a whole lot of people that don't like you, but the people that do like you, like you for you, not what you are trying to show them that you are just to fit in. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, to your, so do you work specifically with women? Um, yes, but I'm actually, starting to, uh, I'm planning to roll something out in November that includes men. Okay, cool. I'm looking, but yes, yeah. I have been working specifically with women. I have worked with men. My boyfriend's a, a breathwork facilitator too. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Fuck. That's just, that, that would just be like the most incredible. I can imagine the energy in that place. <laughs> Four hours of breath work. What are we having for dinner? <laughs> Well, he doesn't do it all the time. Like I do, right. He's, he's got his thing, you know, he's in construction. He's a general contractor. So he does, he does his whole thing. And then like, he does this other thing and he didn't start doing it until, uh, I introduced it to him. Right. And he was exactly the same as me. Like he rides a Harley and, um, says fuck a lot and has a lot of tattoos and long hair and does not look like love and light whatsoever. Yes. Yes. Exactly. And I think that's a cool thing to note as well that, you know, that whole opposites attract thing. I mean, obviously there's truth in that from a symbolic perspective, but relationships are uh, just really whatever works. There's not one individual that has to embody that side of it. Just like, you know, it really kind of ebbs and flows. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's funny because, um, He's somebody that I knew for uh, a few years, right? We've been together about a year and a half. And um, like I said, and I've been divorced about two and a half years, right? And I hired him in January of 19, right? To build the yurt. And uh, one of the reasons why I hired him was I always, I I mean, I I really didn't like him like at all. I kind of thought he was a fucking asshole and a douchebag, right? 
And uh, he really didn't like me. He thought I was just a raging bitch, you know, and um, we knew each other from going to 12 step meetings, um, but I knew how to build things. And I was like, perfect. Like I will hire him because I know I'm not going to be attracted to him and it's going to be fine. Right. Because I, I just, it's just not there. Right. And I hired him to build the fucking yurt and um, we fell in love. No way. So how did that come about? From, from literally not liking this guy to falling in love. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't know. I was changing at such a rapid pace myself with everything oh. about me. And he was changing at a rapid pace with stuff that he had gone through in his life. I hired him to do a bunch of like handyman work. I hired him to build the deck for this. And then I got the kit for this, for him to build this. And, and he was just, I work from home and it was a very pool boy situation. You know, I work from home. My window faces the backyard. He'd be out in the backyard and I'd be like, huh. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> I made him lunch a few times and we would just have these conversations and we would talk and talk and talk. And I was like, holy shit. I think I have a crush on this guy. <laughs> this guy builds a nice yurt. <laughs> so he built me a yurt and we fell in love. I mean, yeah. it, it's just, it, 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 and it's the best relationship I have ever had in my life. It's yeah, fucking- yeah. That's cool. I, I think um, I, I'm really interested in um, relationships and, it, you know, it comes up a lot in counseling. Um, as I'm sure it does in breathwork facilitation too, you know, and I think one of the most important things when it comes to relationships is we, uh, we know the cliches, we know, you know, it's two people working on themselves and it's two, two whole people that come together. But I think something that people really, I suppose, don't forget, but um, underestimate is, is the power of like shared goals you know, having like a future and a reason to be together. Cause it's like, we now live in a world now where, you know, women don't need men for the finance and men don't need women for the children. Like it's a bizarre world now where it's like people can go and have their own kids in labs and, and people can make heaps of money playing with toys on YouTube. Like it's a weird, weird world. And there really now has to be that question of, okay, genuinely, like, why are we together? What are we doing? Like, is our life going to be sick? Like, what's our future like, you know? Um, how does that kind of play into your relationship? I'm interested. Well, um, it's, it, it has been quite interesting because I was doing something very, very different than, than him. You know, he's doing, he's doing construction and he came from, you no, know, he doesn't have any kids and he, I owned a home and, and, or I still own a home and, and he, you know, was, you know, had roommates and it was like a very, um, like he, it was just different for him. He wasn't going from like a full family unit and I have two kids. Yeah, right? yeah. So that was actually, uh, one of the things that we talked about in the very beginning. And I was kind of shocked because I told him like via text or something, I was like, well, you know, I might be having a crush on you. Right. Mm-hmm. And he had, he responded to me and he said, well, well, I said, I said, if you keep being so sweet to my kids, I might get a crush on you. And he said to me, um, sounds like you already do. And I'm, yeah. this motherfucker. Right. So oh, yeah. I, I just, I just ignored that text for like 24 hours, which would make him crawl in his skin. But either way, you know, um, when we, when we, after that we talked and, and he sent me this big old long text about how, you know, these are the goals that he has. This is where he wants to go. Like he wants to move in this direction. He's not fucking around. He doesn't want some bullshit relationship. He's not a booty call, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, what the fuck, you know? And, um, but we talk about this on a very, very regular basis, like where we're going, like, where's the next goal and the support is so huge. You know, he just made a huge job change this week, actually. And um, with that, you know, he comes home and he talks to me about it and he runs it by me. And he, he says, you know, what do you think about this? And then I have shit going on at work, like big business plays that I'm making, or if I'm going to buy a bunch of stock or something, you know, and I come home and I talk to him about that. And it's like this, it's not only like we don't share finances or anything like that, but um, it's this level of respect and community within the relationship in moving forward and having that same direction. Right. And wanting to go like he and I are both very goal oriented and we want to just build an empire. Right. That's period. That's how it's been since the beginning, Mm -hmm. you know, 
do all these things and we want to make a bunch of money and live really well and go on vacations and help people and be satisfied, you know? So that is a conversation that is regularly had. And I can tell you with my ex-husband, that conversation was never, ever, ever had. Mm. He was, I wanted to, you know, go rule the world, right. And build these businesses and, and move forward and do all these different things. And he wanted to punch a time clock and that's where we continually just drifted, yeah. you know, it was yeah. huge. I think, I think it's, I think it really is. And, and I think, um, you know, as well, what, what's so cool about shared goals, it sounds like especially true for, for your relationship is that it, it's exciting. Cause it's like, okay, this could really happen if we do this stuff together and, and trust ensues as a process of the excitement that comes from achieving those goals, you know, because people always talk about this intangible thing called building trust in a relationship. And um, it's practical if you apply it to, I suppose what we're, we're talking about here, you know, it's like, Hey, I want to do this. I want to do this. Trust is a consequence of you guys building an empire together you know, because we both have skin in the game. If you and I are building an empire together, we both have skin skin in the game. Now I'm doing all this stuff. We have no time to think about other things and the relationship grows and it grows and it grows. And it's, um, it's one of those things I think where it could, I feel like it could be the most important thing in the, like the why in the relationship, but all we want to talk about is the romance and, and, and other things. So does that come up in your breathwork stuff? Um, not as much as you would think it does, you know, um, I have, I work with a lot of women, um, and quite a few of them are, uh, single, but when it does and they're not, it's, it's very, uh, it actually, it actually does the whole, like being supported on different journeys. So it's not necessarily like building an empire's kind of support that is being seeked, but it's, it's growing in this line together, right? Mm. Or this whatever together, right? So I'll have women come to me and say, you know, I, I feel like my husband doesn't hear me or he thinks I'm ridiculous to come to breath work or, or whatever it is. And just that level of support. And I think that in combination, opening up yourself and being vulnerable with these pieces of yourself, being seen with your own partner yep. and with communication, real communication, like I feel really sad right now and I don't know why communication or I'm really scared about this interview that I'm about to have, or I'm concerned about, you know, the financial market or whatever it is that, that comes up sometimes too. And, and it does, you know, I'm sure that's talked about it with counseling is the communication thing, but it's like communication, shared goals. And I think the key part of that shared goals thing is kind of like what I was saying in a sense that being included with that shared goal. We don't necessarily need to like build a business together, but I'm including my partner in what's going on with my business and sharing that goal. I never did that when I was married. I yeah. would like invest a bunch of money and not tell my ex-husband. And it wasn't, we, we didn't, you know, it, it's not like I was hiding it or anything. He just didn't care, you know? Yes, exactly. Exactly. There was just that, I suppose. Yeah. To your point that, um, lack of communication. And I think, I think this is a really cool part of the conversation because there's a, I'm, I'm sure you would start to see patterns emerging in what the women you're working with are saying. Um, and obviously, you know, there's more of a, um, a feminine feel to that there. So what are they saying in terms of how the masculine partner could Im improve or what's the number one complaint or feedback that you're getting that's coming as a result of the, the breathwork sessions? Well, see, when I work with women, it often comes up sexual power, right? And their own um, personal intimacy and allowing themselves to be vulnerable in a relationship like sleeping naked or whatever, like fucking with the lights on or feeling pretty, that kind of stuff. What I'm, I hear often is that I do this or that and my husband or my partner or whatever, I just feel like they don't care. They don't see me. You know, there's like this blind spot where men 
in my experience, not all men, not my partner, right? But a lot of times men will see women doing all this stuff, right? Like, oh, I'm going to the yurt on Friday night. And it's like, okay, honey, you know, yeah. and um, the women actually want them to be more involved in it. Like ask what, what is going on? Like what is coming up for you, you know, mm-hmm. and being seen on that level. And a lot of the stuff that I'm doing, um, and that I do in breath work is, is I encourage women as much as possible, like go get some fishnets and stilettos, you know, go attack your husband, you know, stand in the mirror, take pictures just for fun, like that kind of stuff. And I hear often that it's like, I don't feel pretty. I don't feel seen. I don't feel appreciated. Right. And trying to fuel that up and just having, you know, the, the man or the masculine or or the partner or whatever kind of put down their phone for a second and really connect, Mm. you know, and, and in the whole thing about relationships, I'm finding more and more. And really I had this gigantic epiphany a few weeks ago about the, uh, the energetic connection when partners are together, you know, and I'm not talking about, you know, just like having sex. It's like, there's, there's, when everybody's in tune, like tuning forks has gone around everybody's ears, like everybody's in tune and knows what's going on with their body and feels seen and feels vulnerable and can have any conversation. There's a magnetic magical thing that occurs like a fucking volcano. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the things that, um, I do, like, I have some stuff rolling out. Uh, I'm hoping Scorpio season, I can roll out some pretty big stuff with partners, kind of a return to intimacy deal. Yeah. Look, I I mean, I think that's so important. I, I, you know, I think for, for all of the good that's coming in the world now about, um, talking about, you know, women can do these things, men can do these things. I think one thing that we're really missing is the, a true celebration of diversity you know, but we're actually celebrating the differences, not, not, not in terms of, um, you know, even to some, some extent, it's like men can do things. Women can't do women can do things. Men can't do masculine, feminine, however you want to say it. It's like, why, why do we all have to be and do the same thing? Can't we celebrate the fact that there are these incredible differences and that to your point, especially judging by what are these women are saying, in, and in this example with men being able to see that and go become more involved, because if we start to just say, Oh, all men and women are the same, it's kind of like, well, why should I take any, um, you know, enjoyment in, in my partner wanting to go and do a breathwork session a year because we're both the same. So I don't care. Do you know what I mean? I do. And, um, it's, it's actually funny because this epiphany thing that I had that, has fueled me up like crazy. Uh, a few weeks ago, um, I had this realization that, um, I need my partner, right? Because I have been taught one of two things, right? Growing up, I was taught like, okay, well, you got to get married. You got to have kids, blah, 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 blah. I went to a Christian school, you know, it was like this whole thing. Right. And, um, you know, I, this, this, images that w- my parents gave me watching them be reliant upon each other for certain things. Like my mom stays home, my dad goes to work and then it went back and forth and all this stuff. And, but, um, so I had to kind of shake that, right. I had to shake that idea that, um, I wasn't going to be okay without being in a relationship. Right. And then I came to this spot, um, a few years ago when I left my ex-husband that, holy shit, like, I don't need a fucking man. You know, like I can raise my kids. I can do whatever I need to. I can hire a fucking handyman. You know, I can cook. I can take, get takeout. I can make enough money to support the whole family. You know, I don't need a man. Right. And so I was hell bent on the extreme side of things of just, I don't need a man. Like I'm an independent woman. Yeah. You know, and then I had this realization just a few weeks ago. So it's funny. We're talking about this is that I need him. You know, I need him because not only it's, it's not two halves make a whole, right? Um, however, he is like the gasoline to my fire. Mm. Yeah. Like I can have a fire on my own, but then he throws some gasoline on it. Like he lights me up. Right. And I do the same thing for him. Yeah. So if I want to live the type of life that I want to live, 
I need him to hold space for me in those times because I don't have to be this stern, tough, can deal with anything bad bitch, right? Sometimes I need to fall in his arms and sob and be held. And my partner does that for me. And I think that's really important that it's like, it doesn't, it, he does that for me when I need it because I can't do it, that for myself or whatever. It's like, we don't have to be alone in any of this. And there's certain things like, fuck man, he doesn't want to cook dinner and I don't want to take out the trash. Yeah. So it's a good gig, you know? <laughs> And I don't know, cooking dinner is a little harder, but still, you know, I don't want to fix stuff around the house either. We're going to start remodeling the kitchen here in a little while. You think I want to be on my hands and knees, like painting and doing flooring? No, I do not. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and and that's totally okay. It's just a bunch of pieces of my own assets and his assets all coming together and making this. That's what a partnership is. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's our household collective. Yeah, for, for sure. I, 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 I also think that, you know, based upon how, what, what's happened to women over the course of centuries and years, I think that that does that inevitable pendulum swing is going to occur because it's like finally now, and, and not even just male, female oppression or whatever it is, but even just like technological advancements, like the tampon in the 20th century, like all these liberations and freedoms that women are afforded now, which is so important, you know? So it's like reclaiming their independence finally that men have had for so long, you know? And yes, of course, I think, you know, men and women on the whole, it's interesting. I didn't think we'd be talking about this, but it, 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 it's interesting. <laughs> I think, um, you know, on the whole, um, we've tried to help each other get out of the pains of survival and being an animal, you know, but, but women have really had to be dragged through the mud in that. So now finally we're seeing all these women going, I can be independent. I can do all these things. But then I think what you're talking about and correct me if I'm wrong, is that final stage of development. It's like I can do and be whoever I want to be and I'm going to do that. But isn't it nice that I can collapse into my partner's arms if I need to? It is. And, it, and it's necessary too, because if I didn't have a partner that I was able to do that with, I would not be okay by myself. I would need like some girlfriends or something because it's the softness that's going to take over the world. Mm. It's the softness that's going to build the empire. Totally. It's like the bad bitch on the fucking throne. You know, it's like, I certainly can be a bad bitch on the throne. I've been doing it a long time. Right. But what that affords me is not letting a whole lot of people in. Mm. And for me to be able to allow people to come in and for me to be able to be soft, it's like he softens me and he assists in me honing my own personal characteristics that need some polishing, you know? Mm. It's, Certainly. it's so true. It's and so, and so it's true. just, it's um, what we need each other as a collective Absolutely. As a collective. And it, it, again, it doesn't necessarily have to be partners, but it really is nice. And I'll tell you, my kids have a different experience with him when he tells them to like do something than they do with me, you know, and biologically my son starts to cry and scream because he gets hurt and tears come down my eyes. Right. That doesn't happen to him. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he can go address the situation and help my son because I'm like, oh my God, you know, it's like this, it's a team. It really, really is a team. And it's this beautiful arrangement that men and women or partners or people can have with one another. Yeah, we could fucking do it alone, right? And we don't have to be super reliant on somebody to be a part of a team. It's like pulling your weight and bringing it to the table. You know? Mm, yeah, absolutely. And it's more fun. Like we're a social species. It's more fun to hang. Like we're in isolation down here. I'm addicted to my podcast right now. Like when, when you texted me before and you're like, Hey, we still on for 45. I'm yes. You better not be quitting on me. I need social. I need people to talk to. I'm dying. <laughs> how isolated are you guys? How, how quarantined are you guys? Oh, we're like crazy. Your house? Yeah. Like after eight, we can't leave our house. Um, so we have like a curfew, um, after 8 PM and then before 5 AM, um, we have to wear these masks everywhere we go. Um, and there's like a fair bit of debate as to whether or not they actually work. 
I'm, I'm sure, I don't know, I don't know, without getting too, because you start to get crazy, you know, and then you start like a little conspiracy theory pops up on Facebook and you're like, I shouldn't read it, I shouldn't, oh, fuck it, I'm reading 10 hours later, you know. So we've got all these things. Um, only one person can, can leave the house at, at any one time, um, but I don't know how many, you know, depending on who listens to this show. Yes, I do that for legal reasons, but for personal reasons, we don't do that. <laughs> um, yeah, so... It's pretty hectic, Carmina, but um, we had a big spike um, about six weeks ago or, you know, or whatever it was. So I think we're just kind of coming off the bat and cases are going down a little bit more now. But, yeah, it's a funny yeah. world for, for the mental health, um, which is actually really it, – it's always, you know, Dickens had it right when he said it was the best of times, it was the, it was the worst of times because that's all happening. But at the same time, since when have we never been able to be – held and, and facilitated in something like breath work, which is essentially a shamanic practice in the comfort of our own homes, you know? Yeah. Well, it's, it's not, um, it's not as bad as it is here. You know, technically we're, we're still, you know, supposed to be staying at home. Right. Yeah. But almost everybody's been considered a, an essential worker, right? Like I'm considered a banker, so I'm an essential worker, but, um, but you know, certain things aren't open. A few months ago we had curfews, you're supposed to have a mask on everywhere you go, you know, but I'm planning my son's birthday party in a couple of weeks. Right. Right. Not that I don't care. It's just that, well, here's the deal, right. With masks. Okay. So you go out into a grocery store and you have your masks on. You had no, people had no idea how important connection is mm. with facial expressions. Totally. You cannot see somebody smile the same way that they would smile right? And people walk around like, oh, you know, and it's just this, it's, it's gone into this, this really big lack of connection. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, through things like podcasts and, uh, doing breath work online and all that stuff, you know, um, we're able to connect in very, very different ways now. It's, it's going to be different. It's going to be so, yeah, it's going to be so different. It's, uh, it's a funny world because it's like we just need for like so many people say, Oh, you know, I'm not a hugger or, you know, I'm just, I'm not a people person, you know, but I think however, however much that resonates for you to your point, we forget how much communication is unconscious and how much we're taking in that aren't words, you know, just like, right now you and I are basing this conversation really unconsciously from like how we're interacting and it's going well yeah. because we're like leaning into the show and like laughing heaps mm -hmm. and it's, it's fun, you know, but out, out in the world. And to your point, I think it's so true. Like we're not seeing people's faces anymore and it just sucks. And we, we, we got so many friends that are um, first time parents and it's interesting. Like how old are your kids? My son is going to be four in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Right. My daughter's 13. 13. Right. So ex yeah, exactly right. So it's, it's the age where this stuff is really, it's really important that we learn social dynamics, you know, how well, he's in preschool. Yeah. He's their preschool is still open, right? Wow, wow. School is not open. So it's yeah. like how my 13 year old supposed to socialize just on TikTok, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you one thing too, is that, um, you know, I've been sober for over 11 years, right? And um, going to meetings is a very, very, very important part of my life. I've always done two, three, four meetings a week mm. for 11 and a half years, right? And even before that, I was in and out of 12-step since I was 18. So my entire life, I've been going to 12-step meetings, right? We can't have meetings. The meetings are done since March. Now in the past month or so, some of them have trickled back with very, very serious rules, right? Wearing masks, the chairs are separated by six foot each, right? So you have a room that can normally hold a hundred can only hold 25%. So you got 5%. I went to one last night, you have 25 people inside and then you have people sitting outside. Everybody's separate. It's insane. And I will tell you that people in their first couple of years of sobriety, there's a lot of relapse happening. Yeah. A lot of relapse. I mean, they're fucking door dashing. Do you guys have DoorDash? No, what's DoorDash? 
DoorDash is like, uh, you can order anything. Uh, it's, uh, you can order anything like from the grocery store. You can order a bottle of liquor. You can order a toothbrush. You can order uh, wow. in a box like McDonald's or whatever, and they bring it to you. Oh my God. That's amazing. It's that, uh, that would be dangerous if we had it. <laughs> it's Postmates and DoorDash. Well, you can DoorDash oh. liquor and you can Postmates liquor. So they'll bring you a bottle. Wow. You know what I mean? So like people that are stuck in their homes that don't want to drive anyways, you can actually go to a bar and get cocktails to go. Oh my God. Oh my God. My head's going crazy right now. <laughs> yes. The bars are closed. We have, exactly. Uh, exactly. we have restaurants with outdoor seating. That's all separate. If those are open. Right. Um, and there's restaurants, there's like, I went to the desert a few weeks ago and it was fucking 120 degrees and a Denny's you guys have Denny's, right? Oh, we might. I know Denny's because I've been to America a lot, but. Okay. So it's just like a shitty chain, right? And um, it's 120 degrees. They had half the parking lot taped off with chairs and tables and misters out there for people to go eat their fucking shitty pancakes. Yeah. (laughs) It's good because you can't eat indoors. They won't let you indoors, right? But the meetings problem, right? We're doing meetings on Zoom. Yeah. It's like Hollywood squares on a regular basis, you know? Um, and so uh, I've had to, I've created a couple meetings, like women's meetings um, and to do regular 12 step meetings over zoom. And it's been totally different because you, somebody is struggling. You can't hug them. You can't hold them. You can't whatever, you know? And I have seen a very fair amount of people fall into deep, dark depression, fall into uh, relapse, fall into anything. There's been several overdoses. You know, I can't imagine being a junkie right now, you know, having to get dope on a regular basis. Like it's, it's crazy. It's, it's so again, a whole nother podcast, right? But it's, it's um, the lack of connection and it's so easy for people that are naturally reserved to fall into a fucking well right now. Totally. You know? to just be forgotten right now. Like people that only have, I've, I've always been very social. I know a lot of people. I have a lot of friends, you know, and I've remained that way through COVID and I've connected with people and I've done a lot of FaceTime and a lot of zoom and a lot of stuff, you know, and, and I do everything I can to fire people up. Right. But, but there are people that are suffering on such a great level through mental health and addiction and alcoholism and the, the drinking levels, the, the sales of alcohol have increased like 300%. Yeah. You know, it's a whole new drink from home, work from home situation going it, on. Over it here. is drink from home, work from home. Exactly right. And, um, you know, one, one of the, I suppose, contentious topics that's very, very dear to my heart is the war on drugs. Cause that's essentially, I'm in that world. Um, drugs, you know, in terms of a spectrum, there have been drugs that, are, um, um, I'd use that didn't turn out too well. There've also been drugs that saved my mental health from psychedelics, you know, and one of the worst things, and you touched on it and I, I wanted to go there because you touched on it. Um, you know, this time right now is, is so it's, it's, it's like the best, if, if you could have thought of a better way to increase addiction, you know, I don't even think you would have come up with something like this to your point, you know, separation, isolation, jobs gone. So people are bored, you know, and what do you do? And and then all of that put on a rubble of trauma, perhaps even from childhood and someone's already using the bottle or the syringe or something to numb themselves from pain. And you've just got um, addicts galore, you know? So I wanted to bring that up because you're, you're right in ground zero here, having been through it yourself and being exposed to these meetings. How are people that are, you know, let's say 10 days sober or first meeting, how are they coping and managing? And what are some of the tools and strategies that have been effective for them? What's well, interesting, I was actually having a conversation with a woman last night who got sober during COVID, right? So she wow. got sober. I found this to be pretty magical because to me getting sober, um, and, and working through, you know, doing 12 step program, right. Is, is there's a whole lot of magic involved. And, um, so she got sober because her roommate 
was in the program and she would hear her roommate on meetings. Like she'd be in the other room or whatever and she would hear her roommate. So she was like, you know, just by osmosis almost like getting these meetings in her system and then realized, holy shit, I need to stop drinking, right? Mm. She's relating with what people are saying because we we tell our stories. We talk to one another and we share and we go over the, um, you know, the book and all, all that stuff. And, and um, I think that people are just following direction just as you would um, in the very beginning because um, the 12 step program started in the 1930s, right? Where there was only the first two areas in which it started was New York um, and um, Akron, Ohio, right? Akron was like a tiny place, you know? And um, there wasn't, uh, they did everything via mail, like postage mail, right? Wow. And uh, that's how they would carry the message to other people. So I think it's almost reverting to very, very old school yeah. the way that it was in the very beginning. And it's a phone call or it's, you know, just, I don't know, it's, it's a trip. But, but, you know, I got sober in prison, right? So I got sober a couple months before I got out of prison. So I don't have a whole lot of empathy for, for the people that are saying, Oh, I can't get sober. There's no meetings to go to. I'm like, well, the fucking you're, you're full of shit because yeah, I got yeah. in fucking prison. You know what I mean? I was on 23 hour lockdown. You couldn't tell me I couldn't get sober, you know, and plenty of alcohol and drugs accessible. Right. Yeah. So it's just reverting to this old school nature of like one person picking up the phone and calling another person and saying, help me walk through this. I didn't know you were in prison. This is, I'm so intrigued. I, I like this whole time I've just been picking at your brain about things that have been going on now, but I haven't even asked you about your story. I'm so sorry. Coming. That's, that's incredible. So what was it like? Because the prison system is something that we like, so clearly we need to do another five shows together, put it that way. <laughs> but you know, one of the, one of the quotes that I love so much about, um, trauma and prison is, is from a man named a physician named Dr. Gabor Mate. And he's basically talking about the fact that if you, if you look at the most traumatized people and you, and you look at what's going on in the prison, basically what you have in, in the U S and I'm sure this is in, in the rest of the world as well, is that the people that are the most traumatized and have been through the most pain are those being incarcerated, you know, and then they're put into more separation, more isolation, more shame. And then when they come out of that, their freedoms are essentially taken from them, you know, obviously with certain discrepancies and things, but you come out of that and you're like, there's no meaning. I'm basically a piece of shit just for existing. How, mm -hmm. how, where is the self-development there? How on earth are you going to get someone away from needing the bottle or needing the drug just to survive because their, their, their level of worth is so low, you know, D does that resonate with you and your experience at all? Or? I've been to, I have, um, I did time once, right. But I went straight to prison. I didn't do county time. I went to state prison and it was gnarly. And I had a very, very gnarly charge, right. I never had been arrested before. So I was not like in and out of the jail system. Right. Yeah. Um, man, I could, I could, I could literally talk about prison for like two hours, but, um, in there, there is such, there is connection on a very spectacular level, right? And community, believe it or not. And at the same time, there is isolation. I would almost say it is similar to what we're going through in COVID in a sense that the very creative people are creating communities like online communities and and thriving and being okay now not a whole lot of people thrive in prison don't get me wrong right um and then you got the people like i said who are falling to the bottom of the well that happens a lot right in order to survive in prison you have to um embody a certain piece of you you can't be just like this love and light that's not gonna fucking fly you know <laughs> And, uh, and to top it all off, you know, in California, uh, nearly everything is pumped with soy, right? There's mm. dog, soy burgers, soy meat, soy, soy sausage, soy everything. Right. And for women, 
uh, pumping them full of soy, yeah. you have raging, imbalanced hormones. Women, I was in with lifers and people that were doing 20, 30, 40 years and um, tons of cancer, breast cancer. I mean, the list goes on, but there is, um, there is this very, very, very strange sense of community and family in prison. Mm-hmm. And I think what happens is I'm trying to say this right. Cause it is, it's, it's so strange. It's hard for people to understand sometimes it's not so much. Sometimes it's, yeah, you're just a piece of shit. You're never going to do better, but the community and the level of family that in women's prison is very different from men's. Okay. So obviously I've only experienced women's the level of family and community that can occur in, uh, Am I on a delay right now? I think I am. Yeah, this. slight delay, but I think you're back now. We'll keep it in. Weird. We'll keep it in. <laughs> okay, but the, but the level of uh, community and family and connection that can occur in the prison system, in a women's prison, right, is so much fucking better mm. than people have streets, they go back. Wow, wow. That sounds crazy, but there is a whole... It's like an underworld. Uh, there are literally, there are families. They call them, there's, there's the mom and the dad and the brothers and the sisters. Like it's not gangs, it's families. It's in, in women's prisons. Okay. And, and all I know about is California, right? I don't know about anywhere else, but um, the, the people who pretty much run the women's prison are the uh, Samoans, right? Really? Uh, they're large people, yeah. much larger than, the rest of the population and, and you have the mama and everybody literally calls that person mama. And then you have the dad and everybody literally calls that person dad. And then you have the brothers and the sisters and the cousins at this, it's this weird family tree. And with a lot of people that are doing decades of time. Wow. And becomes the comfort zone because it's, it's a level of family and connection that people who generally are going to prison have tons of trauma and addiction, right? That they never had that. So I better fucking get back there because I'm only okay there. Yeah. Wow. That's, I think that's just a beautiful representation of the core of what it means to be human that belief beneath all the layers and, and externalities and all that sort of stuff. We're just craving connection. That's all we need. Yeah. I mean, we need many other things, but it's like, we need connection. So fucking bad, you know, so bad. And you can't achieve connection without being seen. And even though these prison communities are not necessarily truly authentic, it gives purpose to someone. Right. It's like, okay, you're considered the kid. So this is your job. And these are your chores. Like literally these are your jobs. And this is how you're going to make the family unit function. Mm. I mean, it is a fucking trip. It is a trip. And I was one of the sideliners. Okay. I did everything I can to isolate because I knew that if I didn't figure out a way to not go back there, I'd be in and out for the rest of my life. Wow. Wow. So, but that would have made it tough when you were in there, surely. Oh, it was fucked up. I did, I did a shoe term. I, I was in shoe for six months in solitary housing. Oh. And solitary housing, right? They call it the shoe, right? The SHU, solitary housing unit. Um, it's not necessarily in a single cell by yourself, but it's in a cell usually with another person unless you murdered a whole bunch of people, right? So uh, I was in a cell with a single person. And I, I got to tell you, man, I had some of the best times of my fucking life in that cell, really? right? Like you see it in the movies. We call it fishing, right? Because it's two-tiered. Okay. And everything's concrete and there's concrete bed. It's cold as shit in the winter time. Right. Um, you don't go outside. It's 23 hour lock. Well, it's, it's, I think you can go outside twice a week, but if you go outside or take a shower or leave your cell in any way, the COs, the correctional officers, uh, toss your cell. So I actually did not leave my cell for six months. I didn't get an actual shower for six months. Whoa. A bird bath. 
you flood the room and you flood the sink and you pour the water from the sink over your head and you take a bath every single day. Oh my God. That's awesome. It's fucking insane. Okay. But this fishing thing, right? Yeah. So in the middle of the night is the only time that you can do it because there's only one CO in the middle of the night and they just don't give a fuck. So what you do is you take an envelope and uh, you cut your sheets, right? You get these shitty black combs. And if you pop all the teeth out of the comb and just leave the end one, you can take your sheet and you can rip it like that. And you make these fishing lines, right? And you tie them and you tie them and, and they're long, super, super long, right? I mean, I'm talking like a hundred feet you can make, right? And you you take the envelope and you have to put the right amount of paper in it because it has to weigh the right amount, right? And you put, poke a little hole in the side of the envelope and you tie it. And there's a gap under the door like this, right? And you get on your hands and knees and you got to look under there and go like, you go like this and then you flick it out, right? And you flick it to the side and then the, the person next to you takes their envelope and they flick theirs out to catch, to hook it. Whoa. Right? And then they pull theirs in and you can get a fishing line going all around, like to 30 different places, right? Yes. Everybody has to work as a team and you hear hooting and hollering and, and talking shit and <laughs> people are passing dope and they're passing, you can get some a very small amount of hooch or food or whatever, or love notes or, or whatever it is, or kites, we call them kites, right? The, the letters. Right. And you pass them cell to cell, right? Until it gets to where you need it to be. You say like, you can write on the envelope, like cell 214 or whatever the fuck, right? And you can even jump tiers. You can jump to the bottom of the tier. And then you have a line that goes back and forth and you can, you know, get it going. You can pass shit back and forth. <sighs> Isn't that crazy? It, yeah. But again, it just, it, that it's so, it's so, wonderfully human, you know, just people coming together. They're all in there together. And it's just like the shared, the shared mission and the purpose. And, you know, because like, I think, and I, I would say that in the past that I've been um, guilty of this as well, because I went on my own journey trying to figure life out, you know, and um, what I'm really now starting to come to realize is that you can make things too complicated. And really what life is all about is just the things we've been talking about, Carmina, you know, like the, the connection and um, feeling a part of something and having it, you know, we could go into the details and the specifics and break down mental health into its intricacies and, oh, I need to have more dopamine and serotonin and I need to fucking sleep 7.3 hours. It's like, or I need to have a laugh with a friend, you know? And I think um, it's just fascinating that even in prison, where you would imagine that separation and isolation are at its worst, people are still finding a way to come together and connect. And I think that's a not just really, that. There's yeah. more though, Tom. There's more connection. Sorry, I lost my earphones. That's okay. There's more connection because there's no cell phones. Good point. You know? Yeah. There's no fucking social media. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's letters. There's love notes. You know what I mean? It's primal. Yes. Right. Now I'm not saying go to prison and go have class. No, no, we're not saying that. Not what I'm saying, right? <laughs> we are However, saying that, guys. <laughs> it, it goes back to like the working as a team thing. It goes totally. back to what we were talking about originally in the, the sense of goals, yes. being a part of something, right? Mm -hmm. Being in, in something. You can't get your shit from cell 101 to 214 without the help of 199. That's so true. You know, like everybody's got to be in it, right? Or somebody's going to get beat up or stabbed on the yard later. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> One of the two, right? It was, it was, there was a lot of fucking laughter and there was a lot of fucking fear and there was a lot of shame and there was a lot of growth and pieces of me died and pieces of me boiled up and came to life, right? Mm -hmm. the survival at its purest form on an emotional level, mm -hmm. right? It wasn't about like who's biggest and baddest. I got jumped real bad at one point, but like, it, it wasn't about that. It, it's about the survival of the mental health. Yes. Right. Yes. And like people made it work. People made it work and people lost their shit. And there were people all in and out of the psych ward section. You know what I mean? 
constant fights, tons of relationships. Oh my God. Everyone is gay in prison. Yeah. Right. It's like, you know, they call them gay for the stay. Right. <laughs> like, you know, like it, women that are like clearly, clearly straight, you know, just absolutely. They, they start dating a, a stud broad, you know, is what they're called. Right. And, and with all the, the soy that they pump them full of, they're growing beards and shit. So it's all this crazy fantasy. Yeah. Fantasy. I, I really, really need to probably work on writing a book one day. I was, I was just going to say that. You, pro- you, you either need to write a book, you should probably write a few books, or start a podcast. Have you thought about doing a podcast? You know, I have, and um, I like every piece of me absolutely wants to do it. And I know I need to, and I'll probably call you for some tips. Yeah, <laughs> like, for sure. Well, Siobhan's just starting one now, but I was going to say like, not, I know. Not, not even just from like a, a marketing thing, just because it's fun. Like you have so much to talk about and so much important yeah. things to talk about. I think that's one of the reasons why um, you, you stand alone because a lot of people talk that there are people that actually have things worth listening to. And I think you are, you fit that box very, very, very easily. Um, so you definitely have some listeners and, and even just from a therapeutic thing, like I, I, I think everyone should start a podcast. I'm so biased about this because it just gives you a platform to say, and if you have one listener or a thousand, you know, it's just, it, it feels good to work through things verbally, you know, it just feels yeah. so good. Well, that's an, an, an important part of healing, right? Mm, exactly. But we would love to say that yoga is going to heal all of your fucking childhood trauma or even breath work for that matter. But you know, it, the truth is, is that there has to be a combination, right? You have to have the body work. You have to have the physical stuff. You have to have the energy work and the talk therapy. Yeah. Talk therapy cannot be completely discounted. You know, I have a therapist. I've been doing EMDR for a few months and it's fucking gnarly. I do EMDR breath work and therapy and I, I go to meetings and I talk to people and all these things, right? Yeah. Or layers. <laughs> It's so, it's so true. EMDR <laughs> there. I, I can't see a difference between when I was taking mushrooms and when I did EMDR, like I literally can't see the difference. It was just like, Oh yeah, that was both. Except that had a weird label, you know? <laughs> so I've, I've never done hallucinogens. But you've done breath work. I've, I've done breath work, right? I, I would love to, you know, kick myself in the butt for, for never have done any, done any hallucinogen. I just did heroin. Heroin was my thing. I like alcohol and heroin and that's yeah. it. And heroin was not enlightening in any way, shape or form. You know, uh, it was all about the numb. Right. Um, uh, but it's funny because my boyfriend did a lot of hallucinogens and a lot of LSD and a lot of stuff like that. You know, he's got several Pink Floyd tattoos. Okay. You know? <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of people I know that have been like, okay, well this somehow, some way made me a better person, but you know, for someone like me who shot too much dope, I lost the right to play with that stuff. Mm, you know, mm. it doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't allow for a space for me to go play with that now. Cause I need to be like 100% sober or I'm not at all. So th- th- this is possibly, um, one of the questions that I find most fascinating, right? Because am I right in saying 12 steps that originated loosely based on Carl Jung's work? Is that right? Uh, very loosely. Yes. Very he, loosely. He's in it because he was the psychologist of a man named Roland. I know the history like crazy, right? Yeah. 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 He was the psychologist of a man named, uh, Roland Hazard who went to go see him. And, um, Carl Jung was, um, very much so pushing the religious aspect of it. Yes. Right. And then this Roland Hazard fellow came, went to Europe and, and saw Carl Jung and then, came back to um, the East coast and he was um, his family was very, very wealthy. This was in the thirties. Mm-hmm. He was introduced to a group called the Oxford group and the Oxford group had six steps and, but they were very religious based. They were very like Christian based. Right. So there's actually still an Oxford group today. Mm-hmm. Right. And the Oxford group uh, that Roland Hazard was, you know, hooked up with some other guy. Right. Uh, named Ebby Thatcher, actually, right? And, uh, well, no, he went, he hooked some other guy and they went and they saved this guy named Ebby Thatcher that was going to be thrown into an asylum because he had been drawn last time, right? Because in the 30s and the 20s and all before that, people just got lobotomies and got thrown away, yeah. right? 
alcoholism was not something that um, was treated ever. It was just lost, absolute 100% lost cause, right? And this Ebby Thatcher knew a man named Bill Wilson. And um, he came to Bill Wilson at some point when Ebby Thatcher had like three weeks sober, right? After being saved by Roland Hazard that was hooked up with Carl Jung. Yep. Okay. So Bill Wilson um, talked to Ebby Thatcher and Ebby Thatcher got him sober. And Ebby said, this is what you got to do to stay sober. And Bill said, okay, that's all fine and dandy, but I can't do the religious stuff. Totally. And then he went on and he actually stayed sober and did what they told him to do, which is like helping others, service, all this. It's very, very all about connection. Yeah. Right. And, um, and then he met a guy named Dr. Bob, right. And Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob got together. They put together some additional steps, making a total of 12, um, after some time, right. It, they were like loosely done. The book wasn't actually written until 1938, but Bill Wilson and uh, Dr. Bob created Alcoholics Anonymous. Yeah. So, Close from there, right? And then in later years, um, I think in 1961, there's some documented correspondence between Bill Wilson and Carl Jung about the connection in, with Alcoholics Anonymous. Wow, thank you. I, 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 that was that's that's answered a lot of questions. That's really it's really interesting. And you know, you know, one of the things that um, I think deters people. Now, I've not suffered from addiction. I've had addiction issues in the past, but I've never had, you know, yeah. to, to that extent. And, um, one of the things where I think people have really deterred from 12 steps, cause I've had, um, former addicts on the show and stuff. And they've said, Oh yeah, 12 steps wasn't for me. And I think it's because it's grounded in that specifically Christian, um, religious, you know, paradigm that, 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 that ethic to it. And, um, because so many people now are just going, well, that's just a belief system, you know, like, and belief systems are important. You know, we can't be human without belief systems. Um, yeah. but I don't want to fall into that dogmatic, um, belief system. What I find interesting and believe it or not, this, this is, I'm a big fan of Russell Brand, right? And I've always wanted to ask him this question, but, um, <laughs> you're just as good because you've been through it too. Right. I wanted to ask uh, as, as, as a former addict who understands belief systems and the power of labels engendering identity, to, you said before, if I did mushrooms, I can I could fall back into that state again. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about how the label of addict or former addict um, engenders your identity in that way? Absolutely, and um, I don't use the word former okay. in any. I was, I got sober the first time at 18 and I was in and out of the program and, uh, mostly in, I would have short relapses and on a short relapse when I was 25 is when I went to prison. Okay. And I got sober at 26 and I've been sober ever since. Um, the way that I am a tried and true addict, alcoholic addict and alcoholic are very much so the same, similar. It's all just a yet, right? A yet meaning that, you know, it's just a, it's just one more thing that the way that my brain reacts, the way that my body physically reacts to alcohol and to drugs is very, very different than that of a non-addict or alcoholic, right? Very different. So <clears throat> when I say former, it's like a neurological thing or a psychological thing, right? That it puts it in my head that that's no longer an issue. Mm -hmm. I have remember every day really that I am, I'm a fucking heroin addict. I'm a junkie. Like I still have, a, you know, scars on my arms. I still have fucking scars on my heart. I still have, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's all still. And if I forget, it takes away my power in my personal experience, strength and hope, you know, and there are a lot of people out there that, um, are against 12 step programs. And, and for me, um, I, at one point, and in certain areas, it can be based in Christian um, belief systems. Yeah. Where I live, it is not. You know, it is really, really not. It is um, very much so in connection with, you know, I choose to use the words like divine or, you know, uh, spirit of the universe or magic or whatever it is, right? The whole like 
Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior does not work for me. It never did. I would walk out of meetings and slam doors over that shit, right? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) However, you know, if I were to put anything that's mind altering in my body, my body and my mind start to rationalize and justify, and it will get me that much closer to, well, you know, a glass of wine really would pairs well with that linguine, you know what I mean? (laughs) And, and I have tried, I have tried a glass of wine. I have tried a beer and literally every time within 48 hours, I have a needle in my arm. Yeah. I can't even take a double dose of Benadryl. Mm. And what it does is it's, it, it creates this craving, you know, it's like this crazy craving that my body needs it. It's fucking insane. That's why they call it the phenomenon of craving because in, in Alcoholics Anonymous, there was another man that played a huge part. His name was Dr. William Silkworth, right? He was a doctor at a world-renowned hospital out in New York City. And um, he was um, not an addict, not an alcoholic, but he worked with strictly addicts and alcoholics. And he would see him just die on a regular basis. So when he met these guys, Bob and Bill, he hooked up with them and was like, holy shit, I'm a doctor. I'm, I guess I'm just going to say give it a fucking shot. Try religion. Try God. I don't know. And like, as a very, very famous doctor at that time with a good name, he put his entire name on the line saying, Oh, why don't you just go with a little bit of religion? You know what I mean? (laughs) Carl Jung, he, the, the letters that I spoke of uh, later in the sixties were in regards to how uncomfortable he was talking about the fact that it was, um, a spiritual awakening of sorts that was the basis of the solution for um, staying sober mm. because that is not acceptable from a scientific point of view. Yeah. It's not right. But it's magic. I'll call it magic. I don't yeah. really care. Anymore. You know what I mean? Exactly. I, I couldn't agree with you more. And you know, it doesn't matter what the word is like we now have, I mean, you know, for that, for whatever reason, science is the the thing that we all go by in this day and age. Oh, it's scientifically provable. It's like, oh, well, then it's got to be real, you know. But for whatever reason, it's like we now can um, conclude how spiritual awakenings or whatever you want to say actually do lead to major shifts. You know, study that um, John Hopkins put out, I think, I think it was John Hopkins, where of the people that had a um, mystical experience taking mushrooms, they were far, far more likely to, I think this was related to cigarettes. I think they're the percentage of those who gave up smoking was like. Gave for nicotine. Yeah, for nicotine. Like 80%. I think it was something, or maybe a 60%, but something crazy, yeah. you know, and I would probably have to, you know, not, not want to just put bullshit out there, but um, it's, 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 I think whatever you want to call it, you know, for the first time you're seeing yourself from the outside or whatever, you know, however you want to say it, there is a lot of truth in that self transcendence. And I think, you know, to come full circle here, we're going to have to do multiple shows if you don't mind, Carmina. Um, I'm into it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, for sure. Um, But uh, to come full circle, I think that's the power of breath work is for whatever reason, you're able to see yourself from the outside with, with, with this incredible sense of, you're just doing your best, mate. You know, like you just, you just, it, it's a, it's a very warm kind of objective. Passion. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and for me, you know, I started doing breath work at eight and a half years sober and um, it changed everything for me. And I don't know that I would be sober today had I not found it mm. because it's like the extra accelerant that I needed to dig into these pieces of myself. Because the thing about it is that for me and my sobriety, um, drugs and alcohol, they're my solution. Yeah. They are, you know, the band aid to the energetic past lives, whatever the fuck you want to call it, all these wounds that sit in me and the way that my brain works backwards on a regular basis and how I, I have this like this uh, magnetic uh, push away, right? To connection naturally, right? that going into this level with breath work, it was just um, an absolute requirement in my own sobriety. It was kind of like the graduate program. Wow. Wow. And it's fucking changed who I am and it's changed my life. And it's allowed me to be seen and connect in a way that I did not know was fucking possible. 
Yeah, it, it, it's awesome. And I'm, I'm so pumped that it did because it's given um, people like myself and, and Siobhan a chance to meet you. And, you know, I think, you know, you said before in the beginning of the show, like it, it is uncomfortable putting what you put out there on social media, but please keep doing it because it's so, so necessary that people see the full ocean, not just the calm ocean, but the tidal waves. And, and if we can learn to love the full spectrum, um, and we see that projected, you know, our part of ourselves projecting people like yourself, um, there's going to be a hell of a lot of healing going on. So I really appreciate you for what you do, uh, come in or, and, um, start that podcast, write that book. I know, I know. I totally need to, I, I never saw myself as a writer, but I have, fuck, I have so many stories. I have so many stories. I have good stories. I have hilarious stories. I have very, very sad stories, but, uh, I got stories. That's what I have, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And you can just transcript it. Like you could start the podcast and then slowly, um, you know, start talking about your stories and things and, um, make a transcript of it and then make that into a book. There's so many brilliant ways that we can share information now. So just, just go for it. You don't have a reason not to. (laughs) I know. I know. Other than working kids and homeschooling, but very true. true. (laughs) But you know, and three dogs, I know you guys have a couple of dogs. I have three. I got both dogs they're ridiculous yeah it's crazy how much time dogs take up it's unbelievable like we have two and i love them to bits don't get me wrong but like if you put yeah. your kids on that and you've got an extra dog we've got two like um you might have a couple of early starts to get on the book <laughs> i know i know but this is yeah i know this is this has been great and i can definitely see us doing some more yeah 100 percent. We'll, we'll we can take a deeper dive into all sorts of things i'm sure Come in and thanks so much for jumping on the show. Guys, thanks for listening. Speak to you next week. Bye. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the content, uh, you are more than welcome to click the link in the description below. That will take you right to a free webinar where I will be taking you exactly through how to design a framework for your life and create that mission that will bring about a sense of intrinsic value to you. Go for it.